This conference will now be recorded. All right, so we're going to get into the basics of insurance, kind of the general concepts, the stuff that you typically don't see in a lot of the exam materials, exam prep. Uh, and it's not like it's the exciting part of the exam anyway. Um, it, it's not the exciting piece of insurance, but it's some things you do need to know to help you get through this test. And so if you get the basic concepts, the general concept down pat, all of that's going to domino effect into the policies. Um, so you got to get the general concepts down. So that's kind of what we're going to talk about. Okay. Uh, we'll go into a little about the evolution of regulation of insurance. Um, in the U.S., it kind of started way back in 1789, right? So we had this insurance agent named Paul. He lived in New York, and he took a vacation over to Virginia, and he spent too much money at the beginning of his vacation where he ran out of money. He, couldn't, he didn't have the money to get back home. And so since he knew how to sell insurance, he decided to sell insurance in Virginia. Well, the federal, federal government caught wind of this. Hey, this guy is selling insurance across state lines. You know, he's licensed to sell in New York. He's selling insurance in Virginia. And so anything across state lines should be federally regulated because it's something we call interstate commerce. Okay. And Paul versus Virginia was a court case um, where the feds wanted to take over the regulation of insurance, but it got dropped, it got denied. And so each state regulated insurance in their own state. Paul would just have to get a license to sell in Virginia and in any other state that he wanted to transact insurance in. Remember, that was 1789. That held true until 1944, the Southeastern Underwriters Association, or decision, sometimes you'll see it as the SEU, uh, kind of flipped the switch and basically took insurance regulation from the states, I guess from the states, and put it in the hands of the feds. So the insurance industry from 1944 was now regulated by the federal government. And that was, that held true for about a year. In 1945, the McCarran-Ferguson Act overturned it and says, hey, most of the insurance is gonna still be regulated at the states. The feds will kick in if the state laws don't exist or aren't very strict, All right? So, and that's kind of what we have today. The most of the insurance is primarily regulated at the state level. Um, again, if there's no state laws um, or anything else, then the feds would kick in. Now, where the feds really kick in and regulate the industry is the use and handling of private and personal information. You got the Fair Credit Reporting Act and things like that. So um, that's where that comes into play. Now, there's also self-regulation. Self-regulation is ethics. Ethics means it's not really illegal, it's just not right, okay? And so we'll get in a little bit on that, but those are the three areas. Most of the insurance is done at the state level, right? Again, the feds do come into play and then we have self-regulation with this, which is ethics. So since I'm in California, I'm kind of doing California's advantage point. Um, every state has a department of insurance. Every state has a commissioner, director or superintendent that oversees the Department of Insurance in that state. And their job is to carry out in the intent of the insurance laws and impose fines and penalties when people violate those laws. Now, the director of insurance or superintendent or commissioner is either elected by the public or typically appointed by the governor. And so you gotta check with your state, all right, to see number one, what is their title name? And number two, how do they get their role? either elected by the people or appointed by the governor. Um, here in California, we have an elected public official called the insurance commissioner, they're elected by the public. Now, if per chance that they resigned or died, um, the governor would actually appoint an interim commission, the commissioner until the next election, all right? And so we kind of have both, most of it's primary elected, but again, if our commissioner uh, had a loss which took him out of office, then the governor would appoint someone to finish the term. As a commissioner, uh, you're allowed two four-year terms, okay? Uh, after that, you gotta go find another career. That's basically how that works. Now, uh, each state also has a different name for the laws. Here in California, we have the California Insurance Code. Some states, they have the insurance laws, or some states, they have insurance or state statutes. Um, these are the laws that are set by the legislature. So these are the insurance laws regulating insurance in your state. Now, 
the commissioner or director is God in this industry. They can do whatever they want within the law, but they cannot change the law. Only the legislature may pass changes to the insurance law. So sometimes the law is a little vague. And so most states have a code of regulations. In California, it's called the California Code of Regulations. And this is where the insurance commissioner can actually create these rules and regulations to help determine the intent of the law. It's right, so like I said, sometimes the law has a little bit of gray area. And so we have to, well, what is the intent of this law? And so that's what the code of regulations is about that the commissioner department of insurance puts together to help um, focus the intent of the law. All right. Some terminology that's kind of strange, but you probably get it as a test question is shall or may. All right. Now shall means mandatory. May means permissive. That's a test question. Under the insurance code, shall means which of the following. And you want to look for the word mandatory. Right? But then there's another question. It says, you know, someone did something wrong. What may the insurance commissioner do? Now, the answer is kind of in the question. It kind of says, what may the insurance commissioner do? And then you have your four answers, right? One says he shall do this or he shall do that. I, I'm sorry, one says he shall do this, one says he shall do that, one says he may do this, one says he may do that. Well, the question says, what may the commissioner do? That means your answers are between the two, may, he may do this or he may do that. Right? You can eliminate the shall answer, because that really doesn't apply. Um, and so read the two may answers, pick the better of the two, and that's your answer, move on, okay? Uh, so it's kind of tricky. Number one, they ask you what is the definition of may or definition of shall, right? But then they use may a lot in the question, okay? What may the commissioner do? He may give you a choice between paying, uh, paying a fine or suspending and revoking your license. And by the way, if given a choice of paying a fine or suspending or revoking your license, the answer they want you to pick is to pay the fine. Because if you give up your license, you're out of the industry, right? So they want you to understand that. And that's one of the test questions you may get. Um, now, anytime you have an address change, when you do apply for your license, you're gonna provide a business address, residence address, and mailing address. Anytime you change any one of those addresses, you must immediately notify the Department of Insurance of that address change. So immediate notification, of an address change. That's how you need to understand it. Sometimes they'll even say immediately in writing, notify the Department of Insurance um, that there's a change in address. Right? The reason this is important is because it's gonna lead up to another question. If the insurance commissioner files a legal notice and they send it to the insured, when is it valid? And it's valid the day the insurance commissioner sends it from his office. Not the day that you receive it, the day that they sent it, because if you updated your address, they know you're going to get it. And so that's kind of where that ties in, just to give you a better understanding. So anytime there's an address change, you have to immediately notify the Department of Insurance of the address change. All right. Relationship of risk and insurance. And so I kind of put this chart together to kind of help you understand how things are. Kind of the flow a little bit. So because uh, a lot of it, you know, you're wondering where does this fit in? Where does that fit in? So risk, let's start with that. Risk is defined as uncertainty of a loss. Right? It's uncertain that you may suffer loss. Your house may burn down, it may not. You may get into an auto accident, you may not. You may suffer disability, you may not. Right? You will die, we're all gonna die, but we just don't know when, that's the uncertain part. All right. Now, knowing risk is uncertainty of a loss, there's two types of risk. Speculative risk, which you wanna associate with gambling. Now gambling, you can win money, you can lose money. And so if there's a possibility of loss or a gain, that is not going to be insurable. Right. Pure risk is what we insure. Pure risk is the possibility of loss only. And that's what we insure, because we can only insure the loss. If you can get a gain out of insurance, the insurance company will not issue the policy, or if a policy was issued, they'll limit what's paid so that you do not get a gain. Remember that insurance contracts are contracts of indemnity, 
It's there to restore you to the condition you had prior to a loss. That means they cover the loss. They're not there to give you any type of gain. Keep that in mind. So knowing that pure risk is the insurable piece, how do you want to manage the risk? And so now we get into risk management. That's what we have. Okay. Uh, we have retention of risk. Now, retention of risk is you don't even buy insurance. Right? That means if a loss occurs, you retain the full cost of a loss. That's what retention means. There's no insurance. Now, that's pretty extreme. The only time you would want to retain risk is if the worst case scenario is known and you could afford it. Right? So if the maximum, you know, let's say they change a the law. This is the maximum you would ever have to pay if you ever got into an auto accident is $500, okay? Well, nobody would buy insurance because you could all afford $500, okay? It could be a dent in your pocketbook, your wallet for a little while, but you could recover $500 pretty quickly. So if the worst case scenario is $500, you could afford it, you wouldn't buy insurance. But they're never going to pass a law like that, okay? And so a kind of a subtle way of retaining risk is raising your deductible. Now remember the standard deductible in all of our property policies is $250. The exception is the business owner policy. The standard deductible on a business owner policy is $500. Right? But so $250 is a standard deductible. If you want to cut your cost, you know, lower your premium, then you can raise your deductible to let's say $1000. So now if a loss occurs, you have to retain or cover the first 1,000, and then the insurance company can cover the rest of the claim. And so by picking up more or retaining more of the earlier dollars of a loss, it's gonna save you money in premium, right? So that's retention of risk. Either don't buy insurance or raise your deductible, right? You can reduce the risk, right? You know, quit smoking, ease up on your drinking, exercise regularly and eat proper foods. That reduces the risk of major medical problems and possible early death. In the property casualty world, that would be, you know, retrofitting your house so it stands up in an earthquake. You know, drive within the speed limits instead of driving fast. You reduce the risk of losses occurring. Right? You can avoid risk. Okay, uh, avoid risk could be, let's say you're in an earthquake area, uh, sell the house and move to some area where there are no earthquake fault lines. Right? That's one way of avoiding earthquake losses is don't live in an area where there's fault lines. Okay, kind of extreme, right? But that's a way to avoid risk. Or you can transfer the risk. Now transfer the risk, there's, there's kind of two parts of this. We're gonna focus on the insurance piece. But transferring risk is if a loss occurs, someone rams you and damages your car, you can basically transfer the cost of the loss to the person responsible by suing them directly, okay? Um, but again, I don't know if you know how to sue somebody. That's going to be time and energy to learn how to do it. You got to go up to court, you know, and hopefully you win. And so rather than do that, if you have insurance, you can have your insurance cover the loss, okay? And that's transferring the risk to them paying a small known amount of money called premium for that large uncertain amount of loss called the claim, right? Um, and so remember, most people by transferring risk, they're basically purchasing insurance and that's the association you need to make. Now, when you purchase insurance, well, there could be some shared issues here and we can share that with reinsurance or coinsurance. So reinsurance is where your insurance company that you went and bought a policy from Behind the scenes, they're sharing the risk with other companies. So let's say you need a $5 million life insurance policy or a $5 million liability policy. You go to ABC company and they sell you this $5 million policy. You pay them the premium. And But behind the scenes, they say, they hold, let's say 1 million, they retain 1 million, and then they share the other 4 million of risk with a couple other companies. This is called reinsurance. Right. This is where if you had a total loss of five million dollars, that first company doesn't pay the whole five million. They pay their one million and the other four companies behind the scenes that you didn't even know about covered, let's say, one million each. And so where the claim is covered. So the insurance companies are sharing the exposure with multiple companies, which reduces the impact. 
right? By spreading the risk among a couple of companies, it reduces the impact on the industry, right? Uh, 9-11, right, the Twin Towers, right? We just had the 20th anniversary. There was one original company that was sold the policy covering the buildings, and there was 22 reinsurance companies. And so that risk was shared by 23 different companies. Well, guess what? All 23 companies are still around because they shared. If the first company accepted the whole risk, number one, they wouldn't have enough to cover the claim. Number two, they'd be bankrupt. Right? That means everyone else would come up short if they had a loss at the same time. So by sharing the risk among uh, multiple companies, right, it spreads the damage to the industry and not one company is heavily impacted where they go bankrupt. Right? So that's reinsurance. And this happens on the life and health side and also the property casualty side. It goes on every day. It's just that it's behind the scenes that you as a consumer buying a policy, you don't realize that happens. Okay? but you need to know it for the test. Coinsurance is where we're sharing in the claim. So health insurance, right? A lot of times you pay a, a major medical expense policy, you're paying a 250 deductible, and then you're sharing the claim with the insurance company, like an 80-20 share. Uh, you pay 20% of the claim, the insurance company pays 80% of the claim. Okay, that's cost sharing in health insurance. That's kind of coinsurance. Uh, we do have that in the property casualty field also. Right? The insurance companies require that you would carry at least 80% of coverage to the value of a property or a building. That means maybe you don't want to insure the building at 100% because you don't think you'll suffer a total loss. And honestly, you're, you're pretty much correct. Okay. In most cases, the loss is not total. Right? But the insurance companies, rather than having you buy less insurance, they're going to encourage you to carry at least 80% of coverage to the value of the building. If you insure less than that 80% coinsurance requirement, you're gonna actually have to pay more of a claim above and beyond your deductible, okay? Uh, so insurance companies encourage you to carry reasonable amounts of coverage, right? That's coinsurance. So reinsurance is when we write the insurance, we're sharing the risk with multiple companies. Coinsurance is at the time of the loss where you're picking up more of the claim or you're sharing the claim with the insurance company. Now, in order to buy insurance, you have to have insurable interest. Insurable interest is having a legitimate economic or financial interest in the preservation of the life or the property that is the subject of the insurance. That's a lot. Keep it simple. In order for you to buy a policy on someone or something, if that someone or something suffers a loss, there has to be a financial effect for you. This is what we call insurable interest, having a legitimate financial, or a lot of times the test will say economic interest in the subject of the insurance. That means you can insure your car because if you got into an accident and damaged your car, it's gonna cost you money to fix it. Therefore, there is a financial interest in your vehicle and you can gladly take out an auto insurance policy to protect you and your car. You can insure your house, kind of the same scenario, but you cannot insure your neighbor's house. If your neighbor's house burns down emotionally, you'd be, you know, you'd feel for the guy, you know, the empathy, oh man, that sucks, dude. All right, sympathy, empathy. Um, but financially, there's no effect for you. Likewise, you could not insure your neighbor's car because if they totaled their car, emotionally you're bothered, but financially it doesn't affect you at all. For life insurance. Right? You can insure people that you are uh, reliant upon for support education. Right? Uh, as an employer, you can insure your employees if they're vital to the success of the company. That's key person insurance. But as an employee, you could not insure your boss. Because if your boss died, you get a raise, a promotion, and now you get this death benefit bonus from the life insurance you bought on them. Okay? Uh, and it's kind of a game. Okay, so... Um, a bank, if I lend you money, I can insure you so that if something happens to you, I get my money back. I'm insuring the loss. Right? So I have a financial interest in you. That's how you want to understand insurable interest. And with insurable interest, we got to make sure that the risk is insurable too. Certain things do not lend themselves to predictability, uh, like catastrophic losses, and therefore they're not going to be insurable. And so this is just kind of a chart that kind of goes with the flow as we get more and more detailed into it.
Okay. So for an ideally insurable risk to exist, we got to have a couple of things. Number one, the law of large numbers should apply. Okay. And you'll see this on your test. This is almost pretty much everyone gets this question. The larger the number of similar risks that are combined into a group, the more predictable will be an insurance company's future expected losses. They even throw in the word homogenous. The larger the number of homogenous exposure units right, that are combined into a group, the more predictable will be the future uh, expected losses. So basically, we're measuring the past in large quantities to get predictability as far as the likelihood of a loss occurring in the future. In life insurance, we've actually created mortality tables. Mortality tables predict deaths per 1,000, right? So out of 1,000 male babies that are born right now, one is expected to die. Now, we don't know which one because you cannot predict individual loss, but we can expect one because historically that's what's happened, right? Um, so that's kind of how law of large numbers comes into play. Now, for the life insurance, in health insurance, we use morbidity tables. Morbidity tables predict what's the likelihood of someone being sick, injured, or disabled. Right? Kind of like what's the likelihood of you dying, now it's what's the likelihood of you becoming sick, injured, or disabled. Those are morbidity tables. In the property and casualty world, uh, we measure the past to predict the future, and this is what's called the pure risk factor. So I'm living in, I'm, I'm near San Francisco. So in San Francisco County, on average, there are two small fires every day. Now, on average, no more than one third of the property is, is damaged. And so insurance companies, knowing that, they know how much premium to collect from this area to cover those losses in that area, okay? Now, it doesn't mean every day there are actually two small fires, right? It just means, you know, two weeks go by and nothing happens and then one day comes around and 20 homes burn to the ground okay but again if we average it out over a longer period of time it kind of rounds out to be two small fires every day that's what law of large numbers is all about so remember you cannot predict individual loss okay and, and you can only predict expected losses in a group not actual losses now, the next item here, in order for it to be ideally insurable, the loss must be measurable. Now, when I say measurable, that means measurable to money. What does it cost to rebuild this house? What does it cost to rebuild this or, re, uh, you know, replace this fender or rebuild this fender? Okay. What does it cost to cover the medical expenses for this type of uh, situation, this medical illness? Okay. Or what does it cost? Um, for this family, right, with life insurance to uh, continue their livelihood, okay? So the loss must be measurable, definitive or associated with money, okay? The loss must be uncertain. That means we don't know when it's going to occur, okay? Um, if it's a certain loss, the insurance companies will not issue a policy. I mean, if the brush fire is already heading to your house, who would want to sell you an insurance policy knowing full well within the next two hours, they're gonna to have to pay a claim and they're losing money. See, that's a certain loss. In selling life insurance, I never had an office. Come on, who would really be knocking on my door wanting to buy life insurance for me? The only people knocking on my door wanting to buy life insurance are the people that just came out of the hospital and found out they have six months left to live because they're terminally ill. And we can't insure them because that's a certain loss. Right? They're expected to die in six months. Again, who would enter into a contract knowing full well when this person dies from cancer in six months, you got to pay a claim and you're going to lose money. Okay. So the loss must be uncertain. The loss should cause an economic hardship. Now, the economic hardship kind of goes back to you got to have insurable interest. There has to be a financial hardship for you in order for you to insure it. Because remember, if you're not financially affected, you cannot buy a policy. And this is where renters get it wrong. A renter thinks if I'm renting this place out and I have my stuff in here and it burns down, the landlord is going to cover the cost to replace my stuff. No, because it's your stuff, not the landlord's stuff. The landlord has coverage to cover the building. You should have a policy to cover your stuff within that building. 
Okay, so the loss must have an economic hardship, and for, to be ideally insurable, the loss must exclude catastrophic losses. There are certain things that are not predictable. They're catastrophic in nature and therefore not covered. Common ones are earthquake and flood. Now, some of those you can buy back. All right. There are some companies that write flood insurance. The national government, uh, national flood insurance program provides flood coverage. It's a limited program. Okay. And earthquake also you can buy back. Some states do offer it to either the state program or through the insurance companies. Okay. Uh, but like nuclear risk, yeah, uh, no, that's catastrophic in nature. War or act of war. We have no idea how much damage could happen during wartime. And so those are common exclusions that do not lend themselves to predictability, therefore are not covered. Again, these are catastrophic in nature. Okay. But you need to know these five items right, in order for a risk to be insurable. There are six requirements in a contract. Now, I'm not talking parts of a contract. These are six requirements in a contract. So if you look at an insurance policy, it has to state who is this policy with? I mean, who is the insurance company and who is the insured? Right? It's gonna state, what are we insuring? Is it a car? Is it a boat? Is it a house? Is it a person? What is the insurable interest that you have in the property or life being insured? What is this contract protecting against? Right, kind of the risk. Right? Is it premature death? Is it medical injury? Is it automobile accident? Is it fire or explosion? Right? So it's going to list the risk, which is associated with perils in the property and casualty. Okay. It's got to state the beginning date and ending date of coverage. So all of your property and casualty policies are short term contracts. Every six months or every year, year, you renew your auto policy. Every year, you renew your homeowners or renters. Every year you renew your commercial insurance, your business insurance, your workers' comp. So if the policy is good for up to a year, it's a short-term contract. Typically life insurance and health insurance are long-term contracts. It covers you for more than a year. All right, so keep that in mind, especially in the life and health world. If you hear short-term disability policy, short-term means it only covers you for up to a year. So if you're disabled, it's only gonna pay you missing income for up to a year. So if you see long-term disability policy, that means this policy is gonna cover you for more than a year, maybe two years, five years, or even provide income up to age 65, okay? And so that tells you a little bit about the contract. Uh, and it does have to list the premium, okay? So these are the six items that must be in a contract. What's not included in that is a company rating. That does not, that's part of marketing materials. That's not part of your policy, okay? You know, how the company's rated. Well, rated A plus on whatever scale. There's a couple different scales. I gotta be honest with you, A and best is the one that's most widely used. And you might actually get a test question on that. Which of the following is the most commonly or widely used rating um, uh, method or rating company that uh, gauges insurance companies' financial stability? And it's A and best. I didn't say it's the best, don't get me wrong. I just said it's the one most widely used. And that's what the test kind of pitches out at you. Types of licenses. We have the property and casualty side, you have insurance agent, insurance broker, insurance solicitor, right? Now, since it says insurance agent, insurance broker, insurance solicitor, it doesn't say life or health at all. That means insurance agents, insurance brokers, and insurance solicitors only do property and casualty. They cannot do life or disability, all right? Now, there are a few states that if you have your property casualty broker agent license, you actually can transact disability insurance. That means you can sell auto insurance and health insurance. That's what that means. But in most states, yeah, disability is separate now, okay? Um, in California, if you had your property casualty license, I think before 1992, um, you could actually sell health insurance along with property casualty with that license, but not anymore. They, they kind of split that up, right? So insurance agent is a person. A person is any legal entity. Any legal entity means person, association, organization, partnership, business, trust, corporation, or limited liability company. Any one of those can be an insurance agent. As an insurance agent, your job is to sell insurance to the public, right? So insurance agents 
sell insurance. An insurance broker is a person, which again, could be any legal entity, person, association, organization, partnership, business trust, corporation, or limited liability company. Now, as a broker, your job is to represent or work on behalf of a client. Your job is to place business with, but not on behalf of an insurance company or insurer. So as a broker, your job is to represent the customer to the insurance company. Brokers do not sell insurance. Brokers secure coverage on behalf of a client with a company or procure coverage on behalf of a client with, but not on behalf of an insurance company. And so, and brokers get paid by charging a fee. Agents get paid commission when they sell the policy. So you can look at it as you will represent whoever pays you in a sense. As an agent, we, the company, pay you commission for selling our policies. So as an agent, you sell. But a broker, the customer pays you a fee for getting the best coverage at the best price for them. All right, so you represent the customer to the insurance company. All right. Now, as an insurance solicitor, they are a natural person. A natural person is an individual human being, just like you or I. Now, an insurance solicitor, as a natural person, you represent a broker agent in transacting property and casualty coverage. As an agent, you're appointed by the insurance company. As a broker, all right, you post a $10,000 bond right, to protect customers' money that you're collecting from. As a solicitor, you are appointed by a broker or agent. Okay. As an insurance solicitor, you can only represent one broker agent at a time. But your job is to transact property and casualty insurance on behalf of a broker or agent. Okay. Uh, we do not have solicitors in the life and health world. In the life and health world, we have a different license. It's a life agent. A lot of times when you're taking your test, it'll say life, accident, and health. Or you'll hear life and disability or life and health. But it's a life agent license, which allows you to do life insurance, annuities, health insurance. Okay, that's what it's about. So a life agent is a person. And again, that's any legal entity. And their job is to represent an insurance company and sell life and or disability to the public. Okay, that's what the definition is. Uh, yes, a solicitor must be licensed. This is kind of funny because that solicitor actually has to take the same 52-hour class in California whatever the pre-licensing requirements are, they have to take the same license exam as a, bro a broker agent has to take. Their license even says broker slash agent. The only way to tell that they're a solicitor representing a broker agent um, is to call the Department of Insurance and ask them, is the person a broker, an agent, or a solicitor? And they'll tell you, okay? But yeah, I mean, all the guidelines are the same. It's just an agent's appointed by a company, a broker has to post a $10,000 bond, and a solicitor is appointed by a broker agent. Right, so yeah, same license. In fact, you can interchange. I mean, you can be you can be an agent for these companies, a broker for those companies. You just can't be, cannot be a broker and an agent for the same company. Okay, uh, but your solicitor license. Anytime if you're representing a broker agent at any time, you can break away and change your appointment from a broker agent to an appointment to, from a company, and you can basically become an agent or break away, post a $10,000 bond, and then become a broker instead of selling agreements with different insurance companies. Okay, so it's the same licensing requirements. It's just how are you positioning yourself to transact insurance? That's what that's about, okay? All right, so life agents, like an insurance agent, their job is to sell insurance to the public. It's just life and health insurance. We don't have brokers in the life and health world. No such thing as a life broker, no such license issued. Right. However, we do have someone called a life and disability insurance analyst. This is another license. You have to be a life agent for at least five years, and then you apply and take another exam to be a life and disability insurance analyst. And a life and disability insurance analyst is a fee-based consultant. Your job is to meet with people. You're going to review their income, their investments, their insurance, their expenses. You're going to say, this is how much insurance you need. This is what kind of insurance you should probably get. Pay me my fee 
because my job is now done. That's all they do is a fee-based consultant. Now, since you have to be a life agent for five years before you become an analyst, that means that you're a life agent and then you add this to the mix, well, now you could actually do both, right? As a life agent, you can sell the policy and get commission, or as an analyst, you can you know consult with people and charge them a fee. Um, and it's either or, can't do both at the same time. And so as an analyst, you charge them a fee to review their situation and say, hey, you should get this type of coverage. And, say, and by the way, I'm a life agent. I can go ahead and place that business. And you can actually do that, but you cannot get paid commission if you already charged a fee. Okay. So it's either charge a fee here. You can place it, but don't get commission. Or you, you, know, you can still represent and, and tell them what to do, but don't charge a fee. Get commission when you place the business. So it's either or not both. Just like the broker agent side. You can be an agent for these companies, you can be a broker for those companies, but you cannot be a broker and an agent for the same company. Right? You can charge them a fee and then get commission when you place the policy. No, that's a conflict. And same thing here. Okay. Um, if you're a life agent, another step you can take is you can get a certificate of registration to act as administrator. So administrator, a lot of times you'll see is a third party administrator or TPA. Um, I don't know if some of you may have worked for a company where your benefits department was a whole nother company, right? So your employer thought and felt it was cheaper to pay an outside company a fee to run the benefits program for them rather than, you know, hiring a benefits department. Now you got to give workers comp. Now you got to give benefits to them too, right? The increased cost. And so you're paying an outside firm a fee to run your benefits program for you. That's kind of a third party administrator. Okay. So that's the property cash side versus life side. You got to keep them separate. Now, in the real world, we, we talk very loosely. You know, I've been selling life insurance for 30 years. So if I go run around in public and I say, hey, you know, um, let's talk about life insurance. And they say, oh, so you must be an insurance agent. You know, you can call me whatever you want just buy my policy, I'm happy, but that would be wrong on the test because I'm a life agent. Now, as a life agent, I represented multiple companies and so I can meet with you and I could place you with multiple different companies. And so if I meet someone in the public, you know, I, you know, hey, which company do you sell for? So I represent multiple companies. In the real world, they'll say, oh, so you're a broker. And again, in the real world, call me whatever you want, just buy my policy, I'm happy, right? But there are no brokers in the life and health world. I'm an independent life insurance agent. Okay, so I'm appointed by multiple companies. That's how you want to understand it. Okay, so keep them separate. Insurance agents, insurance brokers do property casualty, life agents do life and health. Okay, I'll mix them up. You can have both licenses, don't get me wrong. A lot of you will hopefully and probably get both licenses. Okay, and that's fine. Okay, but for the test, insurance agents cannot do life and disability. So go a little further with that. I just want to make sure you emphasize that as an agent, you represent the insurance company, right? We appoint you, contract you to sell our products. That means you're going to sell to the customer. But as a broker, right, you represent the client. You're going to charge them a fee. They're going to pay you to secure proper coverage for them with, but not on behalf of an insurance company. So brokers represent the customer. Agents represents the company. Agents sell insurance. Brokers don't sell, brokers secure or procure coverage on behalf of a client with, but not on behalf of a company. Right. Make sure you get the flow down. That's pretty tricky sometimes. Solicitation prior to agent appointment. So let's say you got your license, you passed your test. Woo, that's awesome. All right. Um, and then you talk to a, a friend of yours and they say, hey, I need a policy right now. But you haven't been appointed with any companies yet. So in some cases, if you get a hold of an application and you sell the policy, you have a customer fill out the application and you submit it to the insurance company with a photocopy of your license underneath the application. So if that insurance company accepts that application and issues a policy, they now have to appoint you as an agent within the next 14 days. All right. So remember your license, you can walk the walk, talk to talk, you just cannot sell the policy unless you're appointed to, so that when you're appointed you have products to sell but in some cases you can submit an application to the company 
And if they accept it and issue the policy, they can then appoint you within 14 days. Now, if you do this, don't take premium. Remember, as an agent, when you take premium, you got to give a receipt. And as an agent, when you give, when you take premium, when you give that initial receipt, you're going to give a binder. Now, if you bind coverage for a company that you are not an agent for, that is automatic license suspension. Okay. So remember, you can submit the application with a copy of your license to the company, and then they can issue it and then collect premium later, but do not collect premium and submit it with that application. Because anytime you take premium, you gotta give receipt. And if you give a binder without being appointed, that's automatic license suspension. Okay, so this is tricky, but it's solicitation prior to agent appointment. Uh, and this does pop up on your test here and there, okay? Uh, this is where you, maybe you're going the independent route and you want to get, uh, you know, appointed with this other company. Um, and so you get a hold of the application, you place one of your clients' uh, information on it with their approval, of course, and you submit it. And if they accept it, now they have to appoint you. Um, and so this is a way to get into some companies that normally you couldn't get into. But if you're already bringing a business, who would turn down business, right? Now, this isn't going to happen with captive companies. They're going to flat out reject the application. So, but uh, again, this pops up on the test. Um, in the real world, you're typically not going to be doing this, but um, you could. Um, uh, but you know, a lot of times, this is a common test question. Okay. Termination of license. Let's say I'm, I'm done with this. I, I just can't do this anymore. Right? Uh, then you can just voluntarily surrender your license to the insurance commissioner. They can cancel it. Okay. Um, if anyone passes away, their license automatically terminates. This is as an individual. This is a natural person. Okay. So if you have an individual license, you pass away, your license automatically terminates upon death. Okay. Um, but if we have an organization, like if one of our key executives passes away in a company, uh, that doesn't mean the company's license goes away. So you do need to understand that an organization will cease to exist as an entity and hold a license if they've dissolved the partnership, they've terminated the association, or dissolved dissolve the corporation. In these three cases, the license has to be surrendered and to be terminated or and going to be terminated. Okay. But if if for an insurance company, if one of our executives passes away, I mean the company has perpetual life, they're still going. So even though a key employer executive passes away, the company's still up and running. Okay. So this is this last bullet, this last, I guess, item here is not grounds for them to give up the license or it's not grounds for the license to be terminated. All right. So all of the reasons, uh, all of the following are reasons for an organization to cease to exist, except, and that would be like a, a key employee of a corporation either dies or becomes disabled or resigns. Okay. So that's not grounds for termination. And so you do get some of these questions. All right. Unfair trade practices. Uh, one of the biggest things is aiding a non-admitted carrier. If you help a non-admitted insurance company do business in this state without having an excess or surplus lines license, that's a misdemeanor. In most states, it's a $500 fine plus $100 a month, in which that fine has continued. Like if you did it for a couple months, it's a $500 fine plus another $100 a month per month for as long as that violation continues. So you cannot act as an agent for a non-admitted insurance company. You cannot advertise for a non-admitted insurance company or help them in any way, shape, or form to get business in the state. If you want to place business with a non-admitted insurance company, you need to get your excess and surplus lines broker's license. Okay, that's what that's about. Right. So don't help non-admitted carriers. Misrepresentation or twisting. Now, honestly, twisting is a type of misrepresentation. Misrepresentation is you're lying to the client to get them to buy the policy. Twisting is you're lying to a client to get them to drop their policy so it frees up the need and the money to now buy yours. Okay? So, again, misrepresentation, I'm lying to get you to buy my policy. And maybe, maybe in, in doing my presentation, I realize you already have a policy. And so twisting is where I'm gonna to lie to you about your existing policy to get you to drop it. Because again, once you drop your existing policy, now that frees up the need and the money to then buy mine. 
So I might lie to you to get you to drop the policy, and I might lie to you to sell or to buy my new policy. And so if I did both in a presentation, that would be two counts. So whatever the penalty is, a misdemeanor and a ten thousand dollar fine, times two. Okay, so be aware of that. So twisting, this is a technical definition. Induce or tend to induce someone to forfeit, lapse, change, or surrender their existing insurance uh, due to a misleading comparison of, of policy benefits, future dividends payable. So you're just lying to a client to get them to drop the policy, and they still have a need, right? And so then you're trying to sell yours. And if you lie in the sale, that's misrepresentation. Okay. Uh, this happened a lot in the life insurance world, the twisting. That's kind of where that really came about, to be honest with you, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, it wasn't really the companies, individuals acting on that, lying to people to drop their policy so they can get a new sale. Uh, unfair trade practice or unfair methods of competition or unfair deceptive actual practices in the business of insurance. I mean, a lot of this is kind of self-explanatory. False or deceptive advertising. I mean, yeah, that'd be prohibited. You know, making a claim that, yeah, your policy does more, it may cost less when it really doesn't. You know, a lot of times you hear that called lowballing, right? Where you, you show them the really, really cheap rate. There's all oh, but your situation, we're going to add this, we're going to add that, you know, and now they give you this higher price, okay? I mean, be upfront, be transparent. So don't be, you know, don't be deceptive in advertising. Boycotting is encouraging people not to buy from a particular insurance company. Coercion. Oh. Twisting your arm. Um, you know, I can sell you that homeowner's policy, but in order for me to sell you that homeowner's policy, you're going to have to switch your auto and your life insurance to my company. If you don't switch your auto and your life insurance over, we cannot give you this homeowner's policy. Okay, that, that's, that's course, that's twisting their arm to move all their business to you. Okay, now that's the illegal way of doing it. You can do it honestly, legitimately. You know, yes, I can say the homeowner's policy, but if you really want the best rate we have, you might want to consider switching your auto and your life insurance over because we have a multi-policy discount, which can save you more money. It's, it's okay to be on the up and up about it, but you can't say you have to switch it over, okay? Intimidation, right? Threatening, you know, yeah, you better buy my policy or I'm going to, you know, yeah, you can't do that. I mean, again, that's self-explanatory in most cases. You and your insurance companies cannot submit false financial statements, right? I mean, that you understand that, right? Be on the up and up. Don't falsify documents. This is a tricky one. Unfair discrimination is prohibited. Discrimination is perfectly fine. And this is where people get it wrong. It's okay to discriminate, okay? So understand that. Discrimination is fine. Statistically, women live longer than men, right? It's discrimination because there is a difference in the sexes, right? Gender, okay? So women statistically live longer than men. Us guys, unfortunately, we tend to die out a little bit sooner. So that's discrimination, but it's based on proven statistical data. Unfair discrimination will not be tolerated. Right? And that's having a bias for no apparent reason. Right? So remember on the exam, discrimination is okay. Unfair discrimination is a prohibited practice that you need to understand. Okay. When you're selling a policy, people will ask you, hey, what protects me if your insurance company goes bankrupt? And as long as you're open, right, and fair, well, you know, I understand that's a concern. We are actually backed by the Guarantee Association. Um, every insurance company that's admitted is required to pay into the Guarantee Association, so our company is not special in that you know, respect. Likewise, if our company does go bankrupt, you're not going to be fully covered. On the property and casualty world, if your company goes under at the same time that your client suffers a loss, a minimum claim they can even file is $100, but the maximum obligation is a half a million. So if they had a $3 million property that burns to the ground when their insurance company went bankrupt, the maximum they're gonna get is a half a million to start rebuilding a $3 million property. You see? So they're not fully guaranteed. Even in life insurance, 
right? If the company goes bankrupt when someone passes away, the maximum obligation of guarantee association is 80% of the face amount, up to $250,000 per any one life. That means if you're one person, but you bought a $1 million policy from four different companies, that's $4 million of total coverage, right? You have a heart attack and die, and all four of those companies went bankrupt, the maximum your family will get is 250,000 because you are one life. It's not per policy, it's not per company, it's per life, okay? So a lot of times on the test, they don't want you to advertise that you're a member of the Guarantee Association because it can be misleading, okay? Can't say, hey, you should buy from our company, we're backed by the Guarantee Association. But didn't I just say every admitted insurance company has to be a member and they pay into it? Your company's not special. Hey, you should buy from us because if we go bankrupt, you're fully covered. Well, you're really not. There are limitations in the event of bankruptcy, okay? And so do not advertise or use the existence of the guarantee association as an enticement or an inducement to encourage people to buy from your company because that would be misleading. And so that's kind of what this section is about. And some of you probably got this one. A lot of people get the, uh, the discrimination question where discrimination is okay. Unfair discrimination, no, 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 okay? Now, if the commissioner feels that someone has been doing something wrong, they've been engaging in an unfair method of competition or unfair deceptive act of practice in the business of insurance, they're gonna set up a proceeding to look into the matter, right? Uh, as an individual, right, or entity, they'll give you a notice of a hearing. Uh, you need to show up for your hearing a statement of the charges against you, a statement of your individual potential liability for civil penalties, okay? And they'll give you an order to show cause why a cease and, disorder, cease and desist order should not be issued. So what that means is if you did something wrong, they may impose a cease and desist order that says, don't you ever, ever, ever do it again. Okay, that's what this is, okay? So if you're found guilty, if it's unwillful, Right? If you didn't mean to violate it, but you're still found guilty, that's a $5,000 fine. Okay? Uh, willful violation of an unfair trade practice is $10,000 fine. And then they give you that cease and desist order saying, don't ever do it again. Well, if you inadvertently, accidentally did it again, that's another $5,000 fine. Because right? it's proven you didn't mean to. But if you intend, that means a willful violation of a cease and desist order is a $55,000 fine, okay? So again, if you violate one of the, the unfair method of competition or practice, it's 5,000 if it's unwillful, 10,000 if it's willful, and then they also give you a cease and desist order saying don't ever do it again. If you violate the cease and desist order, it's 5,000 if it's deemed unwillful, but it's 55,000 now if it's willful violation of a cease and desist order, okay? Uh, there is a notice of hearing shall be given or held no less than 30 days from the date the notice is served. Now remember, they know you're gonna get the notice because didn't we say in the earlier screens that you are required to give them immediate notification of an address change, right? So that when they send the notice, they know that you're gonna get it, all right? That's what that's about. So, uh, yeah, that's kind of the foundation, the basics of it. Uh, at this point in time, I'm going to open it up to any questions, not just on the material we just covered, but any material at all that we've been, uh, you've been studying. So you guys are all unmuted. Any questions? Good morning. Um, hi, Mr. Nancy. I uh, I didn't get the last uh, part uh, with the season disease. The, 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 how, how much of the second violation uh, did you say? Okay, so for a cease and desist order, if it's unwillful, it's a $5,000 fine. But if it's a willful violation of a cease and desist order, it's now a $55,000 fine. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cause yeah, I mean, you were told not to do it again and you did it again. Okay. I mean, that's kind of how you want to view that. Department of Insurance doesn't take that lightly. All right. Yeah. All right. 
All right, any other questions? On anything? <laughs> it's a lot, I know. Uh, and this about administrator for the life agent. The administrator can work for either for agent or broker, you say? Okay, as an administrator, that's going to be on the life and health side. Okay. Um, and so what it is is you you you're a life agent license, and as a life agent, you get appointed with an insurance company, and then they're going to give you a certificate of registration of administrator. That's how it's on file with the Department of Insurance. And so you're basically like a third party firm that oversees and runs employer sponsored benefit programs. One of the biggest areas that administrators um, basically for the test work in would be employer self-funded plans. Okay. Uh, administrator, you also see ASO or administrative services only contract. Uh, and it's an administrator, administrative service only. You see administrator, so that's that same uh, cert certification. Um, so what's happening is we have an employer, they want to self-fund their employee benefits. That means they don't want to they don't want to pay for premium for insurance for their employees. They're going to cover all their employees' medical bills and claims out of their company's pocket. And for a large company with a lot of employees, there's a lot of predictability where you could do that. Right? You have a lot of employees' predictability. You got a lot of money to cover claims. Right? But if a couple of your employees suffer some catastrophic losses, you could go bankrupt. And so a self-funded program, think of a high deductible employer-sponsored program. So you're an employer and you've got like a $10 million deductible. So as an employer, you're going to cover all your employees' medical bills until you pay $10 million. Once you pay $10 million, then the insurance can kick in and cover the rest to keep your company from going bankrupt. Right? With a high deductible, your rates are pretty low. Okay. And that's where that third-party administrator comes in. They help administer the program, certify the claims, and help pay claims. Uh, but the employer provides the money for the claims. So the employer self-funded program is that? What's... Yeah, if you're doing a life and health exam, you're going to get uh, one or two questions on employer self-funded plans. That, uh, the administrator is involved with the employer self-funded program. Is that right? Yes. Yep. You got it. And sometimes they're called stop loss contracts. I'm sorry, kind of what? Stop loss contract. Talk. Okay. Stop. Ah, S T O P, like stop, stop sign. Oh, stop okay. loss contract. Okay. okay. Kind of another way of saying like a, a high deductible employer sponsored uh, program. Okay. You got it. Well, more other questions? Uh, mm -hmm. Hi, this is uh, Jocelyn. Hi, Jocelyn. Hi, I had a question uh, regarding, uh, you mentioned something about discrimination and uh, I think Aaron is gonna appear in the test. Uh, yeah. You said this type of discrimination that it's fine. So I'm not quite, here in that. Okay, so discrimination is okay. I'm gonna keep that in mind. See, people get this wrong. Discrimination is okay. There's nothing wrong. Okay. I'm gonna joke around. When you do your laundry, do you separate your whites from your colors? Uh, yes. So you just discriminated, didn't you? Well, I don't in know. A, <laughs> that's what it is. And there's nothing wrong with that. Do you understand? Okay. Okay. Unfair discrimination is not to be tolerated. And that's the discrimination based on race, uh, you know, national origin, ancestry, right? Sexual orientation. Okay. And that's unfair. And that will not be tolerated. Okay. Uh, women living longer than men, they pay lower life insurance rates than men. We pay higher life insurance rates because statistically that's how it works. In health insurance, women pay higher health insurance rates typically than men because women have a tendency to go to the doctors more often than a guy would. 
You see what I mean? And so the rates are discriminated based on proven statistical data. Okay, so it's not like biased for no reason. It's based on proven statistical data. And that's what discrimination is. Unfair discrimination is we're not going to write you because you're you're gay. You know, and that that's we don't tolerate that. Okay, that's the unfair discrimination. Okay, then I just want to okay. see that part. Yeah. I know a lot of people okay, hear discrimination, you think, oh, that's bad. It's bad. I'm like, no, no, it's not. And and on so the it's test. Gonna, um, yeah, because that was like my question. Like, if it's going to appear in the test, um, just to read like the question and make sure like what type of discrimination it is, right? Yeah. So which of the following is acceptable practice or which of the following is not acceptable practice? Okay. When you see not acceptable practice, you just see discrimination. You think, oh, that's the one that's not acceptable. Oh, no, no, no. Discrimination is okay. Unfair discrimination is not okay. Okay. Thank you for answering. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No problem. And that is a tricky one. They're all tricky. Yeah. Well, on your test, you get like one third, they're pretty straightforward. One third causes, you need a little thinking. And then one third is like, holy cow, I don't remember studying this at all. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> but you, most cases you need 70% in most states to pass a test. In California, you only need 60%. That's a D, you know, on your normal standards. Other states, you just need a C minus and you get a license to have unlimited income potential. Uh, that's a good <laughs> that's good news the uh, the hard uh, part is that it may use so so much uh, you know subjects so much is a mix match uh, of everything that it's hard to remember and you know it could end up with failing to test yeah but the repetition you'll pick it up okay you you got to you got to be thorough with my material um, and repetition will help you get through this test. Um, and a lot of the stuff you're learning is just to pass this test. Once you pass this test, a lot of this information you're not going to use. Okay, it's just a pass test. Okay. And do you have another webinar, live webinar? Because uh, always when I catch on, it's already uh, yesterday. Uh, yeah. Today so I record, I'm recording this, and I'm still recording this now, and I will post it on my site. Uh, but yes, I will put up next week's uh, webinar. I'm um, not sure what topic I want to cover, um, but uh, I will have it posted tonight, okay? Yeah. So, yeah. To the HO and, uh, you know, dwelling policies, the comparison and all that, it's a confusing yeah. subject. I have that. Don't I have that? Are you are you accessing my website to study? Okay, so when you log in, if you go towards the bottom, uh, you have links to recorded uh, webinars. Yeah, it just one is sh showing just one at the time. I don't know. Maybe I'm looking at the wrong spot. Yeah, yeah. When you log in, where you have the sample uh, exams, if you keep scrolling down on that page. You'll see that it's under the playbook, under the charts. You'll see uh, pre-recorded webinars, and there's there's quite a few. I think I have about fifteen of them. That's cool. Okay. Take another look. Sure. Okay. Thanks. You got it. All right. Well, if there's no more questions, thank you, thank you, thank you for. Uh, taking some time to spend with me, learn a little bit more uh, to help you get through this licensing exam. Um, you got to trust yourself, all right? Be thorough with the material that you're studying. And definitely, if you haven't registered with me, reach out. Um, just contact us at LGD Consulting. Um, and if, as you're studying, if you have any questions, you can definitely reach out also. Okay, so don't hesitate. I'm here to help you uh, get through this test and, and jump into an amazing career path in the financial services industry so thank you and you guys have a great night good luck in your study good luck on your exams thank you have a good night thank you